Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. This week, we present two works in progress from current Wilson Center public policy scholars. First up is Matt Bai. Matt is the chief political correspondent for the New York Times Magazine. He also writes the Political Times column for The Caucus, the Times political blog. He's working on a book currently titled All the Truth is Out, Gary Hart and the Week that Changed American Politics. Matt, welcome to Dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. I hope that stays the title. You know, yeah, we, I say change, currently called because I know editors have a way of changing I like titles. it, though. I think we all like it. It's so a good title. we're going to hold with it. Let me, let me talk to you about the initial idea for the book. At, at what point did you realize that this story represented some marking point in history where things changed? Yeah, that's a great question, John, because it's honestly been on my mind for years and years, and uh, I kind of kept coming back to it. Uh, you know, my entire era of political journalism, I've covered four presidential campaigns, and uh, I've watched it grow increasingly uh, difficult. I've watched the breach in trust between journalists and candidates growing increasingly large. And so I've asked myself for a long time, why is it so different from the books I read growing up mm -hmm. when people hung out together and talked to each other and, and had some sort of common purpose in trying to get the public informed about ideas and what was going on. And, uh, you know, I don't think there's any one moment you can point to, but, but increasingly, uh, you know, I'd also met Gary Hart and talked to him. Increasingly, I began to feel that, that that moment really was a pivotal moment where a lot of forces in the society and in politics and in journalism collided uh, to really begin to change the relationship between the press and politicians. And, uh, you know, what, I'm, w what this book is about is, is marginally it's revisiting uh, uh, what I think is a really compelling and important moment in politics that has largely been forgotten. When you talk to college audiences, they have no recollection of who Gary Hart is. But uh, it's also about, you know, really where political journalism began to change and what the impact of that was. Since the story is somewhat forgotten, maybe we could have you do a re quick sure. recap of what happened during that week, monkey business and Donna Rice and all of the things that Sure, occurred. yeah, and, and, and the thing you need to start with, because this is the thing that, you know, when you talk to students, they really don't have a concept of. You know, Gary Hart was once described to me years ago by a Democratic strategist in Washington as the most important politician of his generation who never became president. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's and his candidacy was hot at the time, Mr. Well, New well, Ideas. Well, this is the thing. I mean, if you go back and look at the polling, and here at the Wilson Center, we have it all bound, so actually you can go, and uh, I was able to just compile that polling. You know, he was, by early 1987, it's hard to imagine what a lock for the presidency he seemed to be, even mm -hmm. though the, camp, the, the, the election itself was 18 months or so away. He was 20 points ahead of the nearest challenger in the Democratic field, and that guy wasn't running. That was Lee Iacocca, right? He was, right. the third place was Mario Cuomo, who also didn't run. He was uh, double digits ahead of George H.W. Bush, who was then the sitting vice president. Uh, he was, according to the Gallup poll that year, the third most admired man in America, actually, behind Ronald Reagan and the Pope. Uh, he was tied with Jesse Jackson, to be fair. And, uh, and you know, so he was a, a major force in American politics and a very likely president. Uh, and it all unraveled in the space of a week. And it unraveled because there were all these rumors about whether he cheated on his wife, was he a, a, a guy who had all these affairs, he'd been separated twice from his wife. And uh, effectively, reporters from the Miami Herald, acting on a tip, went to his townhouse in Washington, hid in the bushes, hid behind their car, and literally stood outside taking pictures, confronted him in an alley by his house, and ran a story about the woman who was in his townhouse and and it blew up and within five days of that he withdraws from the presidential and help me, my memory is sketchy on this i admit but isn't there a famous moment where essentially he uh, challenges them to well this is you know this is i'm glad you brought it up this is a fascinating aspect of of the book and and of this incident because this this is the central memory that people have of this is that gary hart said follow me around put a I'm tail, not doing put a tail wrong. on me if you want that's what he said put that's a right. tail on me on board so when and you say well you know do you understand that reporters went and actually hid outside his bushes and looked in, you know, obviously the answer is, well, he told them By to, he said, put a tail on. But it wasn't, because he gave that quote to E.J. Dion, mm -hmm. now the columnist of the Washington Post who had my job, essentially the New York Times Magazine. He gave that quote to E.J. for a long magazine piece, and then, as now, magazine pieces take many weeks to produce. In the interim, the Miami Herald heard this tip, decided to follow it, staked out his townhouse, and while they were doing the stakeout, which had already commenced, the magazine's advance issue comes out, and the Herald looks at it and says, hey, 
of course we can do this. He asked us to, and they throw it into their story. And from then on, everybody believed, and still believes, that the Herald acted on Hart's own challenge. But in fact, that is just 100% inaccurate. Huh, very interesting. And uh, if this was a moment where things changed, what was the previous standard? W what changed? Well, you know, for basically the entire uh, you know, modern era, for politics before that, the personal lives of candidates, uh, the, this certain zone of privacy about their behavior was off limits in the media. It wasn't always, I mean, you don't want to be too categorical about that because if it broke into the news, if it became a campaign issue, it was always news. So when Nelson Rockefeller, say, divorces his wife and marries a staffer 20 years younger than him, right, and, and Republicans are up in arms about it, you had to cover that. Uh, Ted Kennedy and Chappaquiddick was a story. But people, but, often, people often cite John Kennedy and uh, famous... Right, that was more often the norm, right? Reporters didn't go looking for that. In Kennedy's case, they actually, they actually purposely turned away from it. And when it did break into public view, in the, like in the cases I just mentioned, it wasn't really all defining. It didn't drown out the context of a career. Rockefeller came back, ultimately served as vice president. Uh, you know, Ted Kennedy, uh, you know, was was lionized in his death a couple of years ago, as a, as as a, a rightfully so, as a great force uh, in in American politics for a long time. So, and and as a paragon of character, mm -hmm. actually. So, uh, so it was part of a person's character, their political character, but not the not 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 all of it. Um, and that, so that, you know, y you can make an argument about whether that was better or worse. But surely the relationship between reporters and politicians was really different. Uh, and a lot of things in the society came together to change that. It's not as if Gary Hart caused this to happen. It's not as if the journalists who followed Gary Hart uh, created this dynamic. You had Watergate, which was a huge influence because you have now a new generation of journalists coming into the process, the boomers. Uh, who, who see taking down a politician as a really great prize and a really great route to success and fame. You have the celebritization in the culture. You have the end of the Cold War, which creates a real vacuum in the debate around ideas, and something has to fill that vacuum. And I think the lingering effect of Watergate and Nixon also being that people really wanted to be sure that the guy they were electing was a good person, wasn't a liar, wasn't somehow weak and deficient in character. All of this collides uh, in 1987. Would you also add to that perfect storm uh, the increasing amount of media, more coverage, the a emergence absolutely. of cable, you have to fill the air Absolutely. Time. Two things, two things happen, you're exactly right, two things happen at that exact moment. One is CNN is brand new and flyaway satellite dishes are brand new. So this is the first campaign where people can go without installing phone lines. You know about this better than I do, right? They can actually go to the scene immediately. So that blows up any story and creates a much more competitive atmosphere. The other thing it's often overlooked is fax technology. Because, you know, before the mid-1980s or so, if the Miami Herald had run that story, it would have taken a couple of days for it to break any, into anybody's consciousness, right? Now you have, you know, hotline starts in 1987, so people can get a compendium of news. Uh, the fax technology is such, there's an article from that year in Time Magazine where they talk about everybody now wants a fax machine because they're affordable and you can, y they're more reliable and you can get information around. So the effect of that I is to create a well, much more competitive Sitting media next culture. to you is your cell phone and we think of Mitt Romney's 47% right. speech and now no, right. there is no safe haven for these politicians. Right. So, so now what is lost in the transaction? What's the problem? Is it better that we know more about what these people are and what they're up to before they, uh, we cast our ballots or do we lose something important to the democratic process? Well, that's a pretty worthy debate to have and, 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 and there are a lot of very uh, esteemed and, and uh, you know, august journalists who will take a different view than I do. Having covered four campaigns, having grown up in this era of, of political journalism, you know, I think we really did lose something. Uh, I think we really did lose perspective. I mean, ultimately, uh, I, and, and everybody deserves some blame. I think politicians being in their bunker deserve some blame. The media deserves some blame. But now ultimately, we're here to help people understand the worldview and the ideas and the the political medal of the people who are, who would like to be president. And how you behave in your personal life might be a part of that character, might be something voters want to consider, but it's only a part. And we've lost all the context around people. And because we see ourselves as put here to expose the flaw in a candidate, to figure out something's wrong with you and we need to figure out what it is, and if we take you down in the process, all the better. Uh, because we take that attitude, that sort of search and destroy uh, attitude, uh, we've created a situation where they really can't talk to us and we really can't get to know them. And 
you know, I think when you watch cable TV and you see all the political punditry that goes on, you know, I think sometimes voters look and they say, well, you're, you're holding out on us because you're trying to be objective and you know more than you're saying. And the truth is actually much sadder than that. I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, and I, you know, I've done my share of it. The truth is we don't know them well at all. We don't know more about a lot of these candidates than you could know searching the web and, and, and doing your own research because we don't get close to them and we don't spend time with them uh, on the record or off. And we don't have dinner and we don't play cards. And, and uh, it's not simply a question of being able to talk about their, how they dress or how they behave or their mannerisms. It's a question of do we understand how they think and how they've evolved uh, as people? Do we understand how they look at the world uh, and what they really want to achieve? And they, in turn, uh, have really stopped advancing any kind of uh, argument for what they would do. Do you see a, a solution? Uh, is there any way to turn back the clock or at least to uh, uh, keep the good things as far as progress but get rid of some of the things that are preventing us from getting better coverage? Or is this train left the station? Is there an alternative? Uh, well, I think these things always change. I, I don't think the train is left the station. I, I'm, yeah, not, I'm not prescriptive because I don't know uh, that, that I could you know, offer any you know, facile answer for that. But don't forget, we're now uh, seeing Americans coming into the political process, not just as journalists or politicians, but as voters and as observers who've grown up with a whole new template of technology. And, uh, you know, those voters are used to a very transparent way of life. They share everything, right? I mean, Americans now, younger Americans, they've, they, you know, there's nothing private anymore Pri for what, them. Pri what's privacy? I don't know. Uh, exactly. But in a sense, that might, you know, that might create more context uh, because they're used to, uh, sharing so much that no one thing really defines them entirely. So, you know, it may be that people get desensitized over time, but, you know, it's not, it, it isn't really just a personal life or a sex life we're talking about. It really is this question I think I would pose to political journalism, which is what is our job here? Is our job to find what's every wrong worst, with every, every law, candidate? Every mistake. Uh, are you, in fact, the worst thing you've ever done? As Bob Carey said to me when I, when I yeah. interviewed him uh, last year, he said to me, you know, none of us is the worst thing we've ever done. I thought that was a really interesting way to put it. Are we all, are, do we believe that these politicians are the well, worst we, thing we've we ever be done? We very forgiving on a personal level and certainly in evaluating our own lives and the mistakes we've made, but when it's a public figure, the distortion is extreme. It, this defines them in ways where it doesn't define us. Yeah, and what is the zone of privacy? What is, because we want people to enter the process and we want them to, we want good qualified people to run and how many candidates have we lost because of the environment that's created and is the skill set that's rewarded is the skill set that gets someone elected does it actually make them the best leader if they're willing to get up and emote and apologize or just lie very effectively about what they've done in their lives does that make them the best leader we can have and how do we come at this with some perspective and some context uh, and and I can't affect that that change I don't, I don't really want to I'm not a media critic nor am I you know I'm not running a newspaper I'm just trying to offer a perspective of, of, of someone who's, who's been there uh, and stepped back and tried to understand what this moment's about. And I've saved the worst question for last, as we discussed before going on the mm -hmm. air. When can we expect to see the book, which I look forward to reading? Oh, no, that's good. Uh, you know, I got to write it first, but I'm, <laughs> I'm about halfway, and the Wilson Center's been tremendously helpful in that. Uh, it's currently on the list. Alfred A. Knopf is publishing, and it's currently on the list for the fall of 2014. So if I do my job uh, and don't get stuck in any horrible so writer's block, lines. Uh, you know, you got you to finish it real early now. Uh, you know, the environment is, is such that you got to be done a year out. But I, I, think, uh, I think 2014 is a good bet. Look forward to it, and uh, please come back when the book is complete. I would love to. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. And when we return, another Matt joins us, Matt Dalek, and we'll learn about the book he's working on right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Matthew Dalek is a Wilson Center public policy scholar and is also associate academic director and professor of history and politics at the University of California's Washington Center. He's working on a book that will place the concept of homeland security into historical and political perspective. The working title is State of Siege, Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and the Battle to Defend America During the Second World War. Matt, welcome to Dialogue. Thanks, Thanks so much us. for having me. Uh, let me uh, take you back to your 9-11 story, which I, I understand in reading your notes was an inspiration for the book you're working on. W what happened to you that day and, and what did it generate as far as the thought process that led to this project? Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm trained as an academic uh, historian and I was in the Capitol building 
Uh, about you a speechwriter at the time? I was a speechwriter uh, for the former minority uh, leader, a minority leader at the time, Richard Gephardt. Uh, I was about 100 feet from the rotunda, where my office is, and maybe a couple hundred feet from the House floor. Uh, and we saw, we all had televisions at our desks, and we saw, I saw the second plane uh, go into the World Trade Center tower. I saw it live. Uh, I saw um, about 45, 50 minutes later, uh, the Pentagon mm -hmm. on fire. And it was then that my colleague and I, who were in this sort of office space, realized that we're in the Capitol building and the Pentagon is on fire, probably has been hit. Uh, and so we evacuated, and uh, I think, you know, working, and then the next day, I was back in the Capitol building uh, working, and I think being not just in that moment, but that extended moment, um, running outside the Capitol building, having officers yell at us to run because there was a plane in the sky, um, having a, a, someone at our staff meeting uh, distribute whistles and bottles of water and when we asked what they were for, uh, we were told, in case you're buried under the rubble. Uh, it was those kinds of things. A sobering that, moment. Yeah, yeah. And seeing the fear. And, and so as a historian, I got to thinking about, are there historical moments that, that add some precedence or, or depth to understand kind of what we're living through now? And this whole notion of uh, homeland security, which to some people is a new concept, uh, it has uh, precedence historically as well. And uh, another attack on the mainland, not mainland United States, yeah. but on the United States, Pearl Harbor. Yep. Yes, uh, absolutely. You know, back then uh, it was called civilian defense. Civilian defense. And the Who coined the phrase, do you know? You know, I, I haven't been able to trace, uh, I, I think its origins uh, lay in World War I, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I haven't been able to trace it back to one singular person. But uh, in, after World War I, there was an Italian author uh, who uh, had this idea of total war. And basically that uh, you would use airplanes primarily to bomb civilian populations, to uh, uh, stoke fear, to destroy morale. And this concept, in a sense, uh, was brought to life in World War II. And, uh, and so even long before Pearl Harbor, and actually my book starts at War of the Worlds in 1938. Why? Tell us about that. Yeah, well, uh, uh, in October 1938. And you're talking, I should say, the, the Orson Welles radio broadcast. Yes, is what we're talking yes. About. about six million, according to one report I read, six million people listened to the broadcast. About one million of those people uh, fled or, or panicked. Uh, it was, uh, uh, the broadcast happened on the heels of uh, the Munich Agreement, uh, and Americans, at least some Americans, were afraid uh, that what was happening uh, or what could happen, what was happening in Spain during the Civil War, uh, the fears in London and Paris that they were about to be bombed, uh, that those fears uh, were also very much on the minds of a lot of Americans. And a lot of the country didn't realize that this was the case until that moment. And so what I'm interested in is this idea that the American homeland or the home front was vulnerable, that enemies um, could uh, incite terror, uh, that they could bomb uh, the homeland, that they could invade it potentially. And this was all part of the national dialogue, both in the media, uh, but also even, I mean, FDR in 1938 talked about how the world has grown, so, has become so small and modern bombers have new range and speed. And essentially arguing that, look, the US uh, uh, cities, you know, New York, Detroit, they could be bombed. Well, you know, it's very fascinating to read your book proposal notes and to think about current times and some of the fallacies that are in play. Mm -hmm. One fallacy you just touched upon is that there was fear then as there yeah. is fear now. And often we talk about this as some new phenomena that is fueled by 24-7 news and that we were somehow much more reasonable, sober, and, and yeah. uh, non, non-reactive in, in an emotional yeah. way back then. But what yeah. your research is uncovering is that's not the case. Yeah, I would actually argue in some ways that there was a, I mean, it's hard to measure levels of fear. Sure. Uh, but that there was almost a greater level, a more intense level of fear, not just among the population, but you mentioned the news media. Edward R. Murrow broadcasting uh, live uh, from the Blitz, from London as bombs were falling, into people's living rooms in the U.S. The newspapers were filled with stories of uh, what was happening all over the world. The bombings in, in China and again in Spain, um, the Blitz in London. And so I think there was a sense that the world was closing in 
on the Americas. There were theories that the Nazis could establish bases, say in Latin America, in a place called Natal in northeastern Brazil, and use these bases uh, to launch strikes, uh, air strikes, land invasions, fears of fifth columnists, uh, and they were, they were rife. Is there a consistent theme of overreaction when you talk about then and now? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a really interesting question, and it is, uh, I think it's hard to gauge because uh, it's hard to know exactly what, um, you know, for example, I mean, now we know that we were only really bombed at Pearl Harbor, right? But, you know, in 1939, 1940, it's not that American leaders did not necessarily know that uh, they weren't going to be bombed repeatedly. So, um, but having said that, yeah, I mean, I do think that uh, that at times, and this is true in World War II, uh, the effort to stoke fear has been used for political and policy purposes, right? To, to justify a particular policy, to justify intervention. The isolationists opposed establishing any kind of home defense or home security program because they thought that it was another step on the road to war following on uh, in the wake of the Lend-Lease uh, Act. Mm -hmm. And Eleanor Roosevelt had an official uh, role here. She was not yes. just the president's wife. Yes, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, who I think is one of the most fascinating figures in 20th century uh, American history, also one of the most prolific, uh, she was in September 1941 appointed uh, as the assistant director of the Office of Civilian Defense in charge of volunteer participation. She was, as far as I can tell, the only first lady uh, in history to have uh, an official appointment in the federal government, in her husband's government, uh, up until uh, Hillary Clinton and a role in health care. Mm. Uh, and uh, she was in this position for about five months until February 1942. Uh, she was uh, pushed out of the office uh, uh, two months after Pearl Harbor and involved in one of the, uh, really the first major national political controversy after Pearl Harbor. And another, well, let me, before I, I mention another player, uh, I want to highlight this quote that you have listed in your notes uh, from Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. If you see something suspicious, report it to the right authorities, but don't try to be, to be the FBI yourself. Mm -hmm. I have to say, it was stunning to read this as I ride to work on the metro yeah. or drive on highways and see all these signs yeah. telling all of us, if we yeah. see it, report yeah. it, if it looks suspicious. Yeah. Um, it happened then yeah. as it's happening now. What's the phrase? If you see something, say something. Say something. The interesting thing about Eleanor Roosevelt is that, I mean, she was incredibly liberal, uh, but she also was an interventionist. Uh, she believed in arming uh, the United States. She thought fascism was uh, the greatest threat. Uh, she went to uh, pacifists in her, in her ideological camp uh, and told them that they had to prepare America. Um, so she was not a pacifist, uh, you know, in 38, 39 or beyond. At the same time, though, she had a very distinct vision, which is that defense, uh, home defense, civilian defense, had to be more about putting on hard hats and preparing for air raids. It had to be about strengthening democracy to fight against the ideological threat of fascism, to show that life in democracy was more worth living. So improving life in the community, uh, uh, nursing, uh, public health, daycare centers, assistance for elderly, um, uh, nutrition and physical fitness were, and, and arts were all very important to her. Uh, so she had a very broad New Deal, a wartime New Deal vision of what home defense or home security should be about. And obviously, uh, that is not part of today's debate. I also want to ask you about a, a, a colorful character, Fiorello LaGuardia. Before he was in airport, he was a mayor. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yes. And, uh, yes. Tell us about his role. Uh, so he was a mayor of New York, and in May of 1941, when Franklin Roosevelt, uh, through an executive order, established the Office of Civilian Defense, uh, appointed uh, LaGuardia as a director, its first director. Now, LaGuardia was still mayor of New York, so he was doing double duty. And it was an impossible uh, task, because he was basically responsible for trying to mobilize the country to uh, civilians, millions of civilians, to defend themselves against who knows what attacks. Uh, at the same time, he was supposed to run uh, uh, New York City uh, as New York was helping to prepare for war. Uh, LaGuardia was also uh, um, in quite incendiary. Uh, he gave uh, a speech in which he basically taunted, this is in May 41, uh, taunted the Nazis and said, I'm uh, no better than 130 other uh, million other Americans 
Uh, I am, uh, you know, I'm ready. Uh, the Nazis can have their panzer divisions. They can have their murder of women and children. Come on, come on, come on. We're ready for you. And that's basically a direct quote. And, uh, and he was also pushed out in February of 42. <laughs> Talking tough uh, was not rewarded. Uh, th we have very little time left and still so much to talk about. And so a promise that as the, when the book is ready, we'll have you back. That'd be great. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask you just to, to quickly talk about some of the echoes of the past as they appear in current mm -hmm. policy or current approaches. Yeah. Uh, you know, have we learned anything? Or are we still making the same mistakes? Or, or are we better prepared this go round yeah. after what happened in the yeah. previous generations? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, there's one huge difference in that this time it's all from the top down. So we've got a Department of Homeland Security, um, 130,000 or whatever uh, federal employees. Back then there were 11 million volunteers. So the idea was that this was not going to be run from Washington. It was going to be a, a, an individual and community-based uh, program. Now, in some ways, that, that had some benefits, right? Because you had people flying planes uh, uh, that uh, uh, doused firefighters. I'm uh, sorry, doused uh, uh, forest fires. Uh, uh, civilians were rescuing people from floods. Um, they were doing all kinds of work because they were organized. At the same time, you know, allowing people to volunteer um, stoked fear. You know, people were told, you know, to watch out for your neighbor and, and spies. And so, uh, and I think if anything, to the extent that a lesson has been drawn, it is that uh, we should not ask people to really do much beyond if you see something, say something. Uh, you know, it's much more the government is going to be responsible. Leave the paranoia for, to us. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And we're going to be responsible for protecting you. And, and, and in Boston, after Boston, for example, uh, uh, civilians ran to aid uh, uh, the victims. But other than that, not much is uh, being asked. Well, it's a fascinating topic, and I really look forward to uh, discussing it with you further. Thanks, Thanks so for much. Joining us. Really appreciate being on. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.